everyone and welcome back to the next interview in my business success tips series. It's my true pleasure to introduce to you today Kevin Roberts and Kevin is the New York based executive chairman of Saatchi and Saatchi one of the world's leading creative organizations with six and a half thousand people in 130 offices are uh, in 70 countries it's the third largest communications group in being part of the publicist group born and educated in Lancaster in the north of England Kevin started his career uh, with the iconic fashion house brand Mary Quant and other early career appointments included working for Gillette, uh, Procter & Gamble in uh, Europe, Pepsi Cola in the Middle East, and then Lion Nathan, a New Zealand brewing company where, where I came to know of Kevin. From 1997 until becoming executive chairman in 2015, Kevin was CEO worldwide at Saatchi and & Saatchi, and in 2011, he became the first non-Latin American to be inducted into the FI AP, which in English means the Ibero-American Hall of Fame. Kevin has honorary appointments and doctorates at a number of universities. At present, he's the honorary professor of innovation and creativity at the University of Auckland Business School, honorary professor of creative leadership at Lancaster University, and honorary professor of leadership and innovation at the University of Victoria, BC uh, School of Business. With his academic colleagues, he wrote Peak Performance, Business Lessons from the World's Top Organizations. And in 2004, he wrote a book which I really love called Love Marks, The Future Beyond Brands, a groundbreaking business book which was published in 18 languages. And we'll talk about that uh, concept in those books in, in this interview. He's also written other books on the power of emotion and the screen age. In 2013, Kevin, who uh, is also a New Zealand citizen, was made a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit, which is a CNZM and, and a senior award in New Zealand. And that was for services to business and the community. He's currently the ambassador for the New Zealand United States Council and chairman of the Australasian Health Food with Recipes Delivery Service, My Food Bag. And you may recall I interviewed Teresa Gatting one of the founders of that not so long ago. He's a former director of the New Zealand Rugby Union and former chairman of USA Rugby. So Kevin, hello and thank you so much for talking to me. I think there's anybody still listening after that long, long, <laughs> long CV? Oh, I did cut it down, but yes, I'm sure they are. I'm so pleased to be talking to you. Now, now listen, I read your um, paper, the red paper, called uh, Brand Loyalty Reloaded, uh, loyalty, loyalty Beyond Reason. And I just quote uh, from it briefly. It says, the quest for brand loyalty remains a relevant goal not only for billion-dollar brand businesses, sorry, brand owners dependent on a legion of of repeat buyers, but also for a gazillion of small business owners and startup entrepreneurs wanting to build a string of zeros behind their, their seed capital. So I'm interested in why you think fostering brand loyalty is a must, uh, as a, a key strategic goal for small businesses and startups. Yeah, I think it's uh, uh, sort of in the early 1900s, there was a great uh, gangster personality called Willie Sutton. Did you ever hear about him in the U.S.? He was sort of uh, somewhere between Butch Cassidy and Al Capone, and, and, and they asked Willie uh, one time, uh, you know, why did he rob banks? And the answer was, because that's where the money is, okay? And loyalty is where the money is on brands. You know, if you can create lo brand loyalty and get people to use you, choose you more often, you know, make you part of their life, become part of their movement. That's where the money is. Brand loyalty sort of comes in two areas. You can get the standard brand loyalty where you're loyal for a reason, you know, because the shampoo gets your hair soft and shiny or the face cream makes you look younger or, you know, beer tastes good and it's uh, a great social lubricant, whatever, <laughs> for a reason. But real brand loyalty is when you create loyalty beyond reason, beyond price, beyond attribute, beyond benefit, because when you can create loyalty beyond reason, that's where the sweet spot is. I mean, Apple creates loyalty beyond reason, beyond functionality, beyond design, beyond price. You know, Apple is no longer irreplaceable, but it is irresistible. And I think when startups get 
started, they spend a lot of time on the business model. They spend a lot of time on obviously getting financial structures. They spend some time on governance. But the critical thing they should be spending time on is making sure they are creating an irresistible brand proposition that will create loyalty beyond reason. They're not building a brand, but they are going to create a movement. Mm. The premium pricing lives, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. So you invented this concept of love marks, and, and you've written two books about them, and clearly they're a passion for you. Would you please explain to my listeners what a love mark is? Yeah, we were struggling with brands. You know, at Saatchi and Saatchi, we've been working with brands for 50 years, and Everything's a brand nowadays, you know. Mm. Politicians are brands, countries are brands, chefs are brands. And brands have turned into, today's brands have turned into today's commodities. Mm. They're sort of all the same. They, they all do what it says on the can. They're all genuine. They're all authentic. They all perform. And they all look just the same. It's a bit like a song by Pete Seeger called Little Boxes, where they all look just the same. So you've got to really build high EQ, high emotional connectivity in a brand to give it stickability and to give it that loyalty beyond reason. So we said the greatest emotional foundation of anything is love, right? You can like something or you can love something. If you love something, you'll marry them, i.e. create loyalty. And if you uh, respect them only, you'll like them and they'll be good friends. So the idea of love marks is to build love into like, from like, really, to add three things, frankly, um, mystery, sensuality, intimacy. If you can add those emotional connections to a brand, you will create a love mark and you will create loyalty beyond reason. Mm. So just playing devil's advocate for a minute, some will say that love marks and the concept that you've just espoused is for big businesses and perhaps not relevant to small. What would you say to that? I don't know why, why small or big matters, actually. I mean, uh, I, guess it, I guess it does in some areas, but generally speaking, uh, we're not talking about small or big. We're, we're talking about um, emotional connectivity. And in the world today, Connectivity, collaboration, creativity are the things that matter. And um, size is not the defining factor, right? Most businesses start small. And most businesses, you know, people say, well, you know, Love Mark's not relevant, perhaps, business to business, you know, B2B. I said, there is no such thing as B2B, right? Or B2C. You know, they don't exist. It's all P2P, yeah. people to people. And in a small business and in a startup, people have never been more important because you don't have big media budgets, you don't have big resources. You've really got to create a movement from the bottom up. And you can do that either through facts and rationality or you can do it through emotion. You, you think about the way Obama was made president of the U.S. seven, eight years ago. That was all through a grassroots movement, all about creating hope, dreams, change. You know, he became a love mark to, to a lot of people and uh, was, was, was voted in to this highest possible office on the basis of uh, intangible emotional stuff with a tiny, tiny spend. All the marketing money, in fact, they spent on the campaign was wasted. And it was really about this grassroots connectivity. So if you're a small business or a startup, boy, you better have something that people can bond with and feel attracted to, otherwise you'll never break through. Mm. It's sort of like make the big decisions with your heart and the little ones with your head, which will be the reverse of what every MBA is taught. Yes, I would agree. Which is why MBAs don't do startups very often. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's look at this idea of mystery, sensual sensuality, and intimacy, because I, I love that and I absolutely get it in relation to business. So can you give my listeners some ideas of how they might go about creating their own mystery, sensuality, and intimacy with their customers so that they're creating the cheerleaders, the love in, uh, with the people that are buying from them? Well, mystery is really about storytelling or really story sharing. Mm. 
frankly, right? The more you know about something, the less interesting it becomes. And we're living in an age where information now is a commodity. We're drowning in the stuff, thanks to Google and so on. You know, so information is not the killer app it was seven years ago. Uh, it's now just a table stake. What people want now are stories, and they don't want to be told stories. They want to be part of the narrative. They want to share the story. They want to be involved in it. So we tend to overload, you know, people's websites are full of information. People's packaging is awful, full of information. Instead, we should take the view that David Ogilvy said years and years ago, the consumer is not a moron, she's your wife, okay? And we should spend time sharing our stories with our customers and, and with our um, uh, targets. Sensuality, we feel the world through five senses, yet most brands, most companies, most businesses only operate on one, at most two. And that isn't, you know, how people respond. They want to know what your sound is, what your smell, your fragrance is. How do you feel to be touched? Whether you're a lawyer, whether you're an accountancy or not, there are opportunities to operate with all five senses. And intimacy is that empathy, intuition, the, the ability to not give the customer what they want, but what they never dreamed possible. To have real empathy with uh, the people you hope to attract, as you say, to be the leaders, the cheerleaders of your movement. Mm, fascinating. So given the uh, advancement of technology, social media, you know, everything digital, uh, and consequently the way in which we're changing the way in which we communicate and interact with our potential audience and our actual um, audience, um, how do you think we need to evolve this concept of, of love marks to, to develop in, uh, mystery, sensuality and intimacy using those t tools? It's the best news that could happen for, for small businesses and for startups, right? Because in the past you used to have to have big media budgets, lots of frequency, kind of a big advertising campaign and you could never you know if it didn't work 100 days in you were facing severe funding pressures now it's not like that at all we get intimacy through technology technology is not only a liberator and an enabler if you can now make technology your slave and make it bend to your will you can do anything you can create great story sharing through uh, technology that just wasn't available to us even a year ago. We can create incredible moments of intimacy because people are very uh, very open and very frank when you're commuting one-on-one -on -one with them on their mobile, on their screen somewhere. So the opportunity to create a love mark has never been more broad and more available to everyone mm. because of technology. Have you got some examples of, of uh, small businesses that, in your opinion, are doing this really, really well at the moment? Well, my food bag is a great example of, uh, the of all three things. It's full of mystery, um, it's full of sensuality in every way you operate it, and it's very intimate, you know. The relationships that we have with customers are one-on-one, -on -one. they're online, offline, they're in their home. They're on every screen imaginable. My food bag's built a hell of a business in uh, in New Zealand through those three uh, tenants. Mm. And what about some on this side of the world, in in, in Europe or America? Uh, I've, I've not spent a lot of time thinking about examples of Delft. Oh, okay. No, that's okay. Um, I'm interested in um, something that you said in um, in your red paper, quoting McKinsey, uh, where McKinsey was saying that 75% of the I don't often quote McKinsey. No! <laughs> well, I, yeah, but this is an interesting quote. I can see why you did this one. 75% um, of players listed on the Standard & Poor's 500, which for people who don't know is a, an American stock market index, could be out of business in 13 years. Now, that was written in your report in July 2014, so that's about 12 years from now, and I found that really fascinating. Uh, Can what, be. They will be. Yeah, well, tell me. Why, why are they predicting that? Well, I talked to the, to the guys about it uh, uh, you know, before, we, before we wrote the red paper, and it's sort of based uh, on, on hard data. So if you look at um, in 1958, 
the top 500 companies stayed on that index for 61 years okay mm -hmm. in 1980 which was you know 22 years later the average tenure was 25 years 2011 the average tenure was down to 18 years okay mm -hmm. So it's already happening. So the churn rate's been accelerating amazingly. Today, an S&P 500 company is being replaced one every two weeks. Wow, really? Every two weeks. That's a fact. That's a fact in the fact box. 2011, 23 companies were removed from the S&P 500, just like that. And so... What's going on is that creative destruction, the rapid pace of technology, uh, shortage of labor, startups coming in competition, hello Facebook, hello Google, hello Amazon, mm. you know, is happening at lightning speed. And so if you just run those numbers and you follow those trends, McKinsey analytically say that 75% of, of 2011's firms will be gone off that top 500 in 2027. It's amazing. But that's how fast this world is changing. So if you're a startup, you know, the world is yours. Well, I was going to say, that's where it's really exciting too, to see, see what the evolving composition of, of those types of indices is going to be over time. So on that, what's your prediction for the future of business, both big and small, in this, as you say, fast-changing business landscape that we're in? Well, I think you said something very smart. It will be big or small. If you're in the middle, it's going to be murky, depressing, hard. It's going to be like old-style World War I trench warfare with a lot of blood, much of it yours. So you better get to be either very small, very niche, very fast, very agile, or get to be big. <laughs> mm -hmm. And still be very fast and very agile, okay? But if you're stuck in the middle, boy oh boy, whether you're in automobiles, whether you're in food, whether you're in uh, retail, whether you're in manufacturing, it's gonna be a real corrosive margin sensitive position to be in and just on that if you're in the big or in your small in the small are you also saying that you can be um premium pricing in the in those groups is, is that what the, what that opportunity will lead to for you yeah you've got to create loyalty beyond reason so you've got to become irresistible to a consumer so that they are emotionally connected to your movement that they do all the heavy loading for you and the carrying and they become as you say a cheerleader they become integral to growing your movement um, and to do that you've got to be idea driven you've got to be creatively driven you've got to disrupt yourselves just like facebook do with instagram and stuff like that you know you've just got to keep innovating uh, innovation and creativity mm. have got to be key i mean i think the core the winners are going to be companies that um are driven by this equation, IQ plus EQ plus TQ plus BQ powered by CQ. So what does that mean? Intelligence quotient, right? You've got to have smart people. You've got to have knowledge. You've got to have skills. It's no excuse now. You know, the world is not going to succumb to Muppets. It's got to have bright people. So you've got to hire well, IQ. Mm -hmm. EQ vital, you've got to hire people with empathy, with intuition, with feel, people who can sense the rhythm of the consumer. TQ, you can't fake it, you've got to belt, bend technology to your will, not be a slave technolo to technology. And then BQ, bloody quick. Okay? <laughs> you've got to do these things at speed, all powered by CQ, which in my case is creativity quotient. Mm -hmm. But in most businesses will be customer quotient. So you've got to have customers and consumers at the heart of everything you do. IQ, EQ, TQ, and BQ, all powered by CQ, then you'll win. Brilliant. I love it. Thank you. So just changing tack for a moment, I'm writing a book on personal branding, and it's coming out um, in a couple of months. And in my opinion, uh, given I've followed you for many, many years, you are very strongly personally branded. You might disagree, but I'll, I'll assume you don't for a moment. Uh, so how have you gone about developing your own personal brand over the years? 
Yeah, I, I think it starts with um, having a personal purpose. Okay, so you, you sit down and you do some work and we have a formal process for doing it because personal branding is no different to branding a brand. Mm. It's the same thing, right? So you, you come at it the same way. You start with your one word equity. What is that one word that describes you? It's either an adjective or a noun. A, Arnold Schwarzenegger to everybody around is the Terminator. George Bush was the decider. Um, you know, you 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 get uh, Winston Churchill, who was probably uh, you know the bulldog. Um, you will get Steve Steve or Richard Branson, who'd be a maverick. You know, what's the one word at the very core of, of your essence? And then you make sure that that one word is the foundation for everything you do. Then you need to answer sort of three questions. What's my five-year dream? Because you know, if you don't have a dream, you know, if you don't know where you're going, all roads will take you there. Most people have objectives or strategies or visions or actually just drift along, you know. Mm. Martin Luther King, you know, did not say, I have a vision statement. <laughs> you know, what is your dream? And, and make that, it's not something that's measurable. It's about reaching for the stars and not counting them. Then answer two questions, you know, when am I my best and what will I never do? Answer those questions and then you're set up to write a personal purpose statement, which is what your beliefs are, what your key characteristics are, what your spirit is. And that'll define who you are, what you are, and how you're going to get there. And you can do all that on a page. And so we've done that with athletes who tend to face this sort of the year before they retire. Mm -hmm. We've done that with politicians to whom this is everything. We've done it with many leaders. But actually, you know, everyone I think benefits from having a personal purpose that they can share with their family, with their friends, with their colleagues, and that they can all work towards. So leading on from that, um Tell me about your, your view on the importance of personal branding in business, i.e. people within the businesses, entrepreneurs, the lead, the founders, um, having really strong yeah, personal brands. it's really important that you have a personality because mm. you know, people like technology, but people love people, and, and they want to be part of something. They want to be involved with someone that they respect, they trust, they like, they admire. Um, so leadership's very important, and... Uh, it's very hard, you know, in New Zealand we talk about having mana, which mm. is really about having a personality and having a consistency that, uh, that people respect and admire and that they will join you in. Because the one role of leadership is to create other leaders. And you can only do that if you have a clearly identifiable raison d'etre, competitive advantage that sets you apart from other people. John Key's got that in, in, in politics. Helen Clark had it uh, as well. You know, it, it's irrespective of party, but these people stood for stuff, whether you agreed with it or not, you were left in little doubt as to what they stand for. So you can choose whether you want to join in that movement or not. Mm. So can, can we create love marks? by way of personal brands, or are, or are love marks more the domain of, of companies and products and services? I mean, love is universal, isn't it? I mean, it's a different kind. I mean, it's a word that some people have reacted negatively to in the past, but I think mostly those cynics and contrarians have been left uh, standing in, in the way the world has changed. And, um, oh, excuse me for one second. And, um, can we get to a place that's Hello. Hello, I'm here. Yeah, okay, sorry. Sorry. Um, so I, I think that um, love is the most profound emotion of all. And um, you can earn it. You're not entitled to it uh, everywhere you go in every business, right? So... Uh, if you ask any CEO in the world, do you want to be respected uh, or do you want your company to be respected and loved, most CEOs are going to go, yeah, well, we go for respect and we go for fear and all this, but, you know, it'd be quite nice if, if people loved us too. And then, you know, uh, and that's why we're doing these social programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think people are more and more 
aware that if you want to hire millennials, if you want to attract these people, they're going to be, they want to be part of something bigger than a company, bigger than a product. They want to see that there is some purpose higher than just strict commerciality, mm -hmm. something more emotional. Yeah, I agree. And finally, if you were giving advice, which I'm sure you do, to a group of ambitious small business owners or startup entrepreneurs, based on your career experience and, and just as you see the world, what would you be telling them at this point? I, I mean, it, it, it start. the first piece of advice, uh, you know, uh, Bob Salert, uh, chairman of Saatchi, when I first joined, gave to me, was start with the answer and work back. So figure out, you know, what the dream looks like, figure out the purpose of the organization, figure out the bigger idea and work back from there. Tom Peters, great guy, he and I worked together a lot, was instrumental I don't know, 20 years ago telling me, fail fast, learn fast, and fix fast. Mm -hmm. And we tend to fail, okay, that's not the real big point. The big point is how fast can we learn and fix? Don't analyze it, don't talk about it, don't explain it, don't rationalize it, just fix it. You know, if it sort of hisses like a snake and it wiggles like a snake, it's probably a snake, so don't call in the snake consultancy and don't Google snake, kill the thing, and get on with moving forward. And I think the third thing for me, it's make the big decisions with your heart, make the small decisions with your head, and when you're starting up, really listen to your heart, feel the emotion, feel the passion, feel the commitment. It's about Brian Ashton, England rugby coach, and I were talking one day about all this. It's about the ABCs if you're a startup. Ambition, belief, and courage. Mm. All three every day. Mm, I agree. And I've got one more question, actually. You've just become the chairman of, of My Food Bag, which is a fabulous business and growing rapidly, as, as you know. Um, what else has life got in store for you, over, personally and professionally, over, ne over the next few years? Uh, it's all about making happy choices, and, and most of them uh, are around family and friends, right? Spending a lot of time with my uh, five grandkids and uh, watching them grow up and being part of that is the biggest thing. And fundamentally, the choices I make are around about doing stuff that I love with people that I like uh, in places that I love. It's as easy as that. Well, that sounds pretty exciting to me. Kevin, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with me. I've really, really enjoyed the interview. I know my listeners are going to get a lot from your many, many years of experience in, in business. There's just so many takeaways here. I've been furiously writing uh, myself. So, yeah, thank you. I really, really appreciate your time and, and wish you well on, in your business and life journey. So very careful with this many, many, many years of experience. <laughs> oh. Uh, you said you're a granddad. At <laughs> the beginning, yeah. <laughs> you're not a 25-year-old, my friend, if you're a granddad. <laughs> Being a granddad is a good thing. I'm, I'm not a grandmother yet, but I might be a step-grandmother one day, so I'm looking forward to that possibility. <laughs> it's God's revenge, right? Yes. <laughs> ever happened to us. <laughs> I keep telling my, my stepson and, and our daughter that, boy, I can't wait to be a grandmother and, and, and do some revenge on them. <laughs> They don't quite understand it yet. It's absolutely as exciting as you're thinking it is. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> it will be joyful. It's a long way coming for me, I suspect, but I look forward to it nonetheless. But, yeah, thank you. It's been absolutely wonderful. I really, really appreciate your time and, and wish you well uh, for everything that you've got happening in your world. Thanks a lot. Take care, though. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kevin.